Ah, okay. So, welcome to the Bearded and Broke podcast. Um, we've we've just finished recording. Um, we started off talking about Icarus, and then we kind of went off on all different kinds of tangents. So, yeah. Um, this is I don't know what episode number we're on. I don't really care to be honest. Um, yeah, talking all about doping and corruption in sports, and just how mental all this shit is. Yeah, I hope you enjoy it. Yeah, if you if you like um, sports and if you like all the stuff around it with um, doping and organisations, this is definitely a good podcast for you to listen to. So, hope you enjoy it. Yeah, let's get into it. Yeah, not bad, man. Not bad. Um, I went on a bike ride earlier and I'm yes. sweating bollocks. I'm on my, I think, second or third cold shower of the day. Yeah. And you leave it, you, you get out, you leave it 10 minutes and then you're just back to normal again. <laughs> back to sweating. Back to sweating like a fat man at a buffet. Icarus, what a show. Man, I mean, we're three, we're three or four years late to it, but we're here now. <laughs> I mean, that, that was one of the most interesting sports documentaries I think I've ever watched. Mm. Um, it's a documentary where, of course, the guy accidentally captures all of that crap happening, where he just does a few, um, well, tries to do a few testing bits when he starts recording it on... Um, just doping and it ends up escalating to him meeting the um doping yeah. agency director from russia doesn't it because he basically he did it originally to see how easy it was to beat the current doping system that's in place yeah. so he did it on this like amateur cycling route that takes like two weeks and then at the end of it uh, he he would do it one year clean and then he'd do it the next year after doping and then, um, so in, in, when he went to go and dope, he originally approached, oh, who's the guy's name? I think it's something really funny like Dick Pound or yeah. something like yeah, that, yeah, yeah. who um, was going to like, advise him on how to beat the system. And then Dick Pound was like, actually, I'm not, I'm not, I don't like, feel comfortable doing this. Yeah. So he instead referred him to, oh, what's the Russian guy's name? Rodchenkov. Yeah, Gregory Rachenko or something. Yeah, who was the head of the doping lab in Russia. And so he basically oversaw all of the doping measures, like controls, mm. for the Russian team. And that's basically how they met. And so he advised him virtually up until the, um, yeah, the race. But the, the, re- the, th- the thing that was quite sad was that he had all those mechanical issues. Because it, it would have been really interesting to see what he would have been able to do completely clean. Yeah, and I think looking at it, of course, at the start where, where we start watching it, he does one year and he comes, what, like 12 or something like that, somewhere mid-table. Um, no, and no, he... hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on. When you consider there was, I think, 200-odd mentalists who do it, and the guys at the top were really, really fucking good, and then you had another little group, and then you had him. So he was right up there. So he was he was good. He was he was good. He did well. I'm not saying he was bad, but that that um, creates a platform, doesn't it? For, for yeah, the first for sure. Year, where that creates a platform, where we say, say for example, out of a group of two hundred, he was twelve. So he was really good, hmm. but he wasn't the best. So oh, for sure, yeah. On, from there on, where you've got him say i i watched it a few years ago you you watched this um more recently than me but mm. say he was 12 the year after that he only came like 10 for some of that didn't he after <laughs> that second year the, th- so, the thing was that he had a bunch of mechanical issues first of all so he did he initially did really well and i think he was as high as seventh or eighth which is pretty pretty damn good and then he had a bunch of mechanical issues which I think dropped him back even further than where he was for the first event. So, right, so, first... so mechanical issues, how many places did that cost him? I can't remember exactly, mate. So but we're I... looking at, shall we say three places that would cost? Sure, yeah. it's, say... part, it's part of the season. If you look at any other sport, you've got injuries, you've got all sorts of things that impact yeah. your, your season. So you just have to take it as it is. Yeah. So 
you've got that, which say three spaces, that would have cost him. Even then, he would have had a good handful of people who would still be better than him. And that just makes you think, are they really, really good athletes that they can still beat someone who's doping? Or are they doping? It raise, it, there's that, but there's also the other bigger question, which is that all the people who aren't necessarily winning, who aren't the Lance Armstrongs of the world, all the people who are kind of middle of, middle of the pack, are those people also doping? And we don't know. So their test results come back clean, but out of competition, we don't know what they could be doing. And that's the thing that really um, worries me as a fan, because as a fan of sport in general, because these, you could have people up there who aren't honest and they're middle of the pack. And then you've got someone up the top who may or may not be truthful yeah i i always had this in mind um of course doing a degree in it and it's quite um i guess sociologically based within sport just legalized a whole lot because then you can create two kind of uh sports where you are testing religiously of course that's going to come with a lot more maintenance and a lot more um funding which is needed to be doing that but then you've got the other aspect of it where you're not testing. Everyone can do what they want. And just see what the human body can do. I mean, who I mean, cares do what you're doing? You know what to do. And that's where you're taking it beyond, super, uh, beyond human powers, where it's, it's probably not healthy, but that's the risk that you'll, you want to take. You've got the choice to stay healthy and to be clean, but then you also have the choice of potentially beating everyone and everything if you know how to dope properly. Yeah. And, you know, this rem- when you mentioned that they should legalise it, it made me think of, because in powerlifting, there's a kind of a split between uh, different federations. So there are some federations that test for steroids and everything, and there are some that aren't, and there are some that allow you to wear a weightlifting belt. There are some that wear- allow you to wear specific suits, which make it easier for you to press more weight. Yeah. And so it makes me think of... Um, all the different way, like the ways that it could fracture sports, if we were to allow allow steroids and other kinds of drugs, because there will be there will always be some purists out there who will say no, we we want clean sports. We want to see what the human body can actually yeah. do without steroids. That's absolutely understandable. I think. I think. I'm quite split in between down the middle. I would want to see what someone who's um, been doping and been knowing how to do it without having to dodge it, where and what boundaries they can push. But also from the other side, I'm thinking, well, actually, no, that's not really fair. Let's keep it as, as, um, as pure as we can. But from that, you, what you do is you just split it. Instead of having, um, I don't know, a hundred meter sprint, you have two hundred meter, well, two one hundred meter sprints where you've got one who's pure and one that you can do whatever you want that's untested, and that's where we'll see a boundary of like a second or so, I reckon, where we'll see someone running at like seven seconds and someone running at nine seconds. Yeah, and you'll see someone like creating strips of flame on the floor as they do. <laughs> right, they transport. They go so fast they transport into a different dimension or something. <laughs> I mean, I don't think we quite live in a cartoon world, but um, hilarious to watch. I, I think I, I'm all for it. I think that we've got nothing to lose. Of course, we would need more funding when sports to be able to regulate the pure if we were to legalize everything. Um, but there's a shitload of funding that goes into um, uh, the World Doping Agency that they can't even regulate properly, i.e., the whole documentary. Um, so if, if we're going to do it, just do it properly, in my opinion. Yeah, yeah I mean, so what, when you say do it properly, are you referring to doping or are you referring to like controlling it? Both. All right, okay. So we split it into two. We almost have two categories in every sport. So of course, going off topic slightly, where you've got um, uh, a, a transgender sports coming in now where um, a man used to be a woman or a woman is now a man um, and you know if a man 
goes um, and has a sex change and goes to be a woman, he competes in the women's championships, it's quite likely that if there were an athlete in that sport, that they're going to go and thrash out all the women there. And that's not exactly fair because all the genetics and his whole body, except, you know, certain areas, are still quite masculine. Yeah. Don't forget, so, he would have had all those years of being a man where you have increased levels of testosterone, which we yeah. know increases muscle mass, which yeah. will result in your ability to better knock somebody out. Or, or whatever the hell. And I, I, I remember listening to the Joe Rogan podcast, obviously being a heterosexual male. It's like, it's like a thing you have to do in order to be heterosexual. Do you listen to Joe Rogan? Anyway, um, he was talking about Brock Lesnar, who's this, I don't know if you know who Brock Lesnar is. He's this. Of course I do. Hmm? Of course I do. Oh. Everyone knows Brock Lesnar. I thought you went, who's he? I was like, what the fuck? <laughs> no, um, I know who. He's this mountain of a man, like built like a brick shit house. Imagine if tomorrow he decided he was going to transition and become a woman. Oh, I feel sorry for all the UFC women. Exactly. Would you really let him fight a woman tomorrow? I, I mean, from the safety side of things, no. But yeah, I, I'm definitely with you on your point. So where we are getting into that transition where I don't think it's fair to, to let that happen, you almost create a third gender such I, I don't know what you want to call it, a third section where i think you would i think you the way you would do that would be you would have someone who male transition to female you would have those and you would have females who transition to males but they wouldn't fight each other if that makes sense no. so you say so you, you, you know it would be set like that so that yeah. the conditions are are fair that way yeah and, you know, this is being very generalistic, but how many blokes go and say, oh, I'm actually shit at this sport. And, you know, I've, I've never really felt comfortable in my body. I'm definitely going to go and do this sport when I get sex change. And then when they get sex change, they're like, fuck yeah, I'm loving it. I'm actually good at this sport now. <laughs> I'm good at this now because I can beat the shit out of women. Well, yeah, it's anything. It's either UFC or, you know, running or I mean, I don't know if it works the same with swimming because you don't really need muscle mass in that. But you get my point. It's, it's speed, power, strength, all that sort of things that they, the um, testosterone helps the body um, develop a lot quicker than a female's body. Exactly. Like it's, it's crazy that people are still allowing this to happen. But like, like where they allow people who used to be male to fight females or whatever. Yeah. It just doesn't work. But coming back to the whole, to what we were originally talking about with the, um, with the doping and everything, what was crazy? What? <laughs> it just took you a while to remember what we were talking about. <laughs> hmm. Hmm. What is it we agreed to talk about? Oh yeah, doping. <laughs> so what, what, what I found really incredible was the level of state sponsorship of the Russian doping or like set up basically. Because, like Rodchenkov said, that Putin knew his name. I don't know how well he knew Putin, but Putin knew of him. Like, people in the Russian government definitely knew Rodchenkov and knew Such a him. Russian thing, though, isn't it? Where they, where they go and do something that's completely illegal, and then they're like, oh, yeah, we didn't know about it. What? <laughs> we, we did that. No, no, surely not. I mean, surely, surely the Americans are guilty of that as well. We're, I think we're, everyone's guilty of it. I was about to say, it wouldn't surprise me in a couple of years when things kind of settle down a little bit and we do some more doping tests and we've got some evidence that Michael Phelps or Usain Bolt or I don't know whoever else are going to come out and be like, yeah, they've tested positive on something. And it's like, mm, why am I not surprised? Exactly. Can we really believe anything? And I'll, I'll tell you something as well, because I was listening to a podcast which is all about weightlifting. And there's been this massive, massive revelation uh, within weightlifting. Because you know you, these former Soviet countries, right? They take massive pride in their weightlifting, being successful at the Olympics. Because, yeah. you know, they're small countries and it's the only, the only thing that they're really good at is weightlifting. Yeah. And so there was this allegation made by this uh, former Iranian weightlifter that the but the head of the international weightlifting federation 
basically came to him on the eve of the Sydney Olympics and said, if you don't, if you compete, we will say that you've tested positive because everyone dopes in weightlifting. So they, they, they had his test results. They knew that he was positive. And they said, if we, if you compete and you win, uh, we will out you as, as doping, as having doped. And, you know, we, you know, you'll be fucked. Basically your entire career will be fucked. So that a person from, I think it was Azerbaijan. So the person from Azerbaijan could win gold. And that was because the Azerbaijani government, or not the government, the Weightlifting Federation, had paid the head of the International Weightlifting Federation, like, many hundreds of thousands of dollars in order to let them win. This is even bigger systemic corruption than the Russian weightlifters, because, or Russian sport in general, because at least there's the veil of competition. Whereas with this, they're just saying, this is so blatant and out in the open. It's crazy. It's mental. I mean, I've never heard of it. So it's very... It just came out this week. Really? Very interesting to hear that because, of course, that would bring up a shitload of stuff where you've got a lot of systematic corruption in the organisations of FIFA and UEFA and all that sort of stuff where it was all obvious for however many years. I I mean, I don't know what's being done about it now, but um, you've got sports like cycling as well, where a load of doping is well known. And in the world of swimming, you've started having that now as well, where you had Sun Yang, the Chinese swimmer, dope, and Fina let him back in. So all these um, uh, like international organizations, which are running sports all around the world it wouldn't surprise me for for that to have happened to be honest so coming back to what i was saying about the uh weightlifting right so the iaaf found that more than 10 million dollars was unaccounted for in the books of the international weightlifting federation that 40 positive doping tests were covered up and vote buying was done to ensure the re-election of the former president. Yeah, that wouldn't surprise me. Like I was saying, all these international organisations do their own thing and everyone's a little bit corrupt because no one really governs them. They do what they want. And it's like FIFA, they've got like a trillion in their bank for reserves it's like who needs that much money for reserves i was gonna say like how much what how big is their expenditure that they need to keep a trillion dollars in the bank just in case something happens well it's it's all bullshit because they pay themselves what they want they do what they want for expenses they get paid for world cups they will continue doing that probably um and it's the same with every sport. It, it doesn't surprise me that you've got all these organisations, not just for sport, that are international. You, you don't know what they're doing and they just do their own thing and say, oh yeah, we've done this. For example, with the um, World Health Organisation. They're like, oh yeah, we've got it under control in China. <laughs> um, While well, we're all sat at home three months later. Yeah, and we're all sat here three months later still locked down expecting a second wave yeah so it's it's all i mean i don't i don't agree with the structure i'm not i don't have a solution to structures and you know all this that all this stuff but it's the same as having a uh, prime minister i don't agree with having one person or, or a president i don't agree with one person being in charge i don't have a solution to the problem but i just don't agree with the whole structure but at least when you have a president or a prime minister, you have checks and balances. So for example, you've got a Supreme court, especially in the U S who will make sure that all laws that are passed are legal and fit the constitution. Whereas in some, in FIFA or pretty much any sporting organization, there's no check to that balance. No regulation as such. They just do it themselves. 
exactly they just do it themselves and there's no one to keep them accountable and that's the biggest thing and that's why it would make sense to have some kind of check and balance to that whether that's you know i'm just spitballing here whether you kind of fuck hmm just spit it out like like something that's kind of regulated like each government has a representative to some big council or whatever and they all are able to have a say but then that that leads but then that leads into um certain countries could pay other countries to bet, get their votes yeah um, uh, it, it, it's it, it you end up going in circles basically exactly with all the solutions that you think of and i'm sure there is a solution there we're just not smart enough for it we do. um <laughs> but um it's just one of those things where it's frustrating being a sports fan and oh my god we're we're recording this whilst chelsea are playing man city um mm. and the emotion i just felt when chelsea scored pulisic goal i don't know if you guys have watched it but it's as a chelsea fan to know that lampard could potentially win more premier league titles for liverpool than gerard ever did that just tops it off with an argument on who's better and everyone can shut up if that happens <laughs> Oh man, the fact that we couldn't win anything with those two in the England midfield is a trap. Oh, tell me about it. You would everyone thought. I remember in two thousand and eight when um, England didn't even go through to the Euros. Mm. Literally that year, I thought that it was going to happen, but no, we didn't even get out of the qualifiers. <laughs> Who did we lose to in that uh, fateful game? Was it Croatia or something like that? Yeah, at home, like. Yeah, three two, I think it was. So Croatia have been a real bastard to us. Then they they yeah. fucked us up in two thousand eighteen in the Euro qualifiers. I'm sure there's going to be some other occasion in history. Yeah. Well, they're not that recent a country. Actually, that probably wouldn't hold up. But still, two. They've done enough. They've, they've done. done enough. They've done enough to screw us over. And the other thing, I just coming again, coming back to the whole doping thing, was the fact that. Oh, I wrote the guy's name down. Kamayev. So Kamayev was one of the guys involved in the Russian doping set up. He was still in Russia and he corroborated um, Rodchenkov's story. And by this point, Rodchenkov had defected, I guess, Mm -hmm. is the term, to the US. And then Kamayev was found to have had a heart attack. Oh no, he's in his fifties, drinks a lot. He's he's got, he's had a heart attack and now he's died. Oh, oh what a what a real shame! That. I mean, that's that's classic Soviet stunt, isn't it? To do mm. something like that, and it's scary because he probably left just in time to actually have his life saved. He would have another week or so, or even another day, for all we know, he could have been caught out and he could have had a heart attack conveniently. Exactly, Rod Rodchenkov could have been really, really screwed there. But then they, they, his wife and children stayed behind, and they've had their passports and everything confiscated. Yeah, yeah, that's really unfortunate, actually. It's so sad, man. Like, the especially I, the, the people I really feel for are the kids in that, mm. because the kids didn't do anything to deserve it. They're just well, the mother didn't do anything either, and then. All he did was he was he told the truth of so much wrongdoing. Mm. So at the end of the day, he didn't kill anyone. He didn't hurt anyone. Do you know what I mean? It's you look at it and you think with proper hard crimes, with everything that's happened, it's so pathetic, I guess, that it's had to come to that end where he's not seeing his family anymore, and his family can't get out of Russia. Mm. But that. Is this a maybe, common maybe thing? Pathetic is not the right word, but it, it's not really. But like, I get, I get the point where it's it's a tragedy almost. Yeah, like, he, the likelihood of him seeing his family again probably pretty minimal because he's still, I think, in um, witness in, protection. Witness protection. That's it. Yeah, he's. Um, yeah, I guess he's he's safe somewhat in that way. crazy man um but the thing you know another thing to have come out of it 
which I, I again I didn't really like was the fact that because the big doping operation, the big setup was the 2014 Sochi Olympics, where they had KGB or it's it's not, it's not KGB anymore, but whatever the modern organization version of the KGB is. Because back in the day, the KGB was, you know, the Soviet secret police and they were brutal, weren't they, in the way that they handled dissidents or people who defected. They were those they were involved in the doping setup for the Sochi Olympics. Because what because yeah. because what they would do was basically whenever they test somebody, they they took two samples. One was frozen for long term, um, so that you can go back and retest, and then the second one was taken to be tested immediately, so that you can confirm. Yeah, and that was that was portrayed in the documentary, wasn't it? It showed the pathway they walked around um, and all that sort of thing. So it's quite incredible that they've been able to draw that out as well. And you, you're saying it was all based on Sochi, yeah? It, that documentary was. But then you look at it and you look at how many medals did Russia have just two years prior in the Summer Olympics? I, I don't know. How many did they have? I'm pretty sure there were fourth in the table. So... Right. I'm not saying Russia's a bad sporting nation because all the so ex-Soviet Union would have had a lot of athletes from that and so on. So they, they should be up there. But from the previous year, I think they were in 2008, I don't think they were even in the top 10. They could have been like eighth or something like that. Sixth, but very much the most. So and it's a big, big jump. Yeah, certainly in 2012, they're like fourth right behind China. So, or China, was it? Yeah, because I think the I think GB no did GB come third in that one in, in what two thousand twelve yeah two thousand twelve it w yeah we were third because I remember that was a big big achievement and then wasn't it in two thousand sixteen came second wouldn't have been second cause we I don't think they came second because you've got China and the US battling yeah. out yeah yeah and they especially with the Chinese training children from the age of like two like that you can't compete with that. So yeah. yeah, Britain came third, which is still a really good achievement. Yeah. So anyway, so as I started to say, it was kind of overlooked because they came fourth and everyone just went, huh, two years after that, their Winter Olympics, yeah, they were doping, but it's fine. We'll, we'll, just, we'll just ignore what happened two years prior. I think they did discuss it in the documentary, but the main focus was the Sochi Olympics. It's because of what happened after the Sochi Olympics, because at the time, Putin's approval ratings were just plummeting. And then you had the Sochi Olympics and they just skyrocketed and jumped back up again. And so you saw his popularity surge and then you saw this invasion in Ukraine, which we, which we know was sponsored by the Russians. I can, like, there's so many, so many things proving that that actually was sponsored by the Russians. What, invasion of Crimea? Uh, so there was the takeover of Crimea, but also the people that are battling it out in eastern Ukraine right now, they're backed by the Russians. Yeah, that's old news, isn't it? It's, it's very old news, but people often forget that. Like, people think, oh, there's a war in Ukraine, it doesn't really matter, but... I think, it, I think it depends on how interested people are. Very true. To be honest. Um, so... Uh, for someone who is kept well up to date, I'd like to think mm, it's same. quite well known. But yeah, all in all, Russians are sketchy. <laughs> Every single one of them, even the Moldovans, isn't that right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so, how the documentary kind of went on after that is quite interesting that. You know, he was really like unsure whether he should be filming and what he's found and all that sort of thing. So you could see how worried he was about him being found and he was explaining things. And it almost went through um, a stage where he was really unsure and then he knew that he's gone too far in explaining things of what happened. He's like, sod it, I'm just going to say everything that I know. Um, exactly, yeah. Which, uh, sorry, go on. Which putting yourself, or, you know, if you put yourself into his shoes, 
it's quite scary to to think that you've got people above you that know you know how to reach you know like everything about you but you can't do anything now all you've got to do is to, to basically stay alive is run away and you might not have a way back ever so it's just so scary that some people have got so much power to be able to enforce it on other people. The funny thing is that this is all over sport. Like That's this, what I mean. You're willing to kill people over sport. But then again, like you said, Putin's rating were plummeting. And through sport, where they're winning more medals, that's like the main pillar internationally of how a country does at the Olympics. Because if they're doing well, it's like, oh, well, they must be doing something good because they're performing well. And that's kind of the platform to showcase what you can do, isn't it? Everyone watches the Olympics. It's entertaining. It's quite good fun. Why wouldn't you? And I think there was, um, there was a um, research article. I don't know what it's called, but I've read it quite a while ago, where they were saying that that's the main reason to why countries want to host the Olympics. Like the Olympics in 2012, for the UK, it cost the taxpayer like 9.3 billion to host with, you know, building um, stadiums, hosting people like running services, hospitality and all that sort of thing. And they were saying that, um, you know, you've got Barcelona in 90... It would have been 92. Was that not LA? No, because 2000 was Sydney. So working back, 96 was Atlanta. 92 was Barcelona, 88 was... Right, okay. Um, no. Yes, 88 was Seoul. Anyway. Either, either, either way, Barcelona and Greece, they've really struggled post the Olympics. Like, they haven't done anything with all their stadiums. All they've been doing is just growing weeds out the, um, out the floor. And, you know, you, all, you see all these pictures of stadiums um, back in 2004 and 98 or whatever Barcelona was, 96, 92. I've got it right. Anyway, one of them <laughs> tempted it <laughs> numerous times. Um, and you see them and, you, and you've got the background where it looks all great. And then you look at it like nowadays and it just looks like a dump. Like no one's looked after it. So what I started with the point was that countries actually – try and host events to showcase the rest of the world how well they're doing but then it takes them like 20 years sorry carry on it takes them like 20 years to actually repay that money and it doesn't seem very efficient to invest it into something like that to then spend however many years repaying it for not really a lot to take back it's not like tourism increases for the 20 years or anything like that it's literally you've got a bit of tourism for like two months and then it all goes back to normality after that. Exactly. And it's really about the upkeep, which is what this, these pictures of the Greek stadium show you. Like, I think we've done quite well with the London Olympics, where, you know, at least it's being, at least the Olympic stadium is being used. We know that the Olympic pool, uh, that's still being used. Uh, the, the velodrome was always temporary, wasn't it? Um, yeah, you've ha you've had a few a few um, stadiums put up and you know tracks and whatnot that were going to be um, temporary. But then you've had stuff like um, uh, was it the something box where they played the basketball in, where they um, actually shipped it off to Rio a couple of years later. Um, so actually, it's, it's very good how much use they're getting of it. But not all countries have done as well as we've done out of London, like. Yeah with flipping brazil their world cup how corrupt fifa is they've built a stadium in the middle of a rainforest to have used it three times and now they've got nothing going on there they do they don't they don't even have a team using it regularly well they've got a team but who they're not going to fill out thirty thousand no. uh, capacity they've got about 300 people in it and it's like a football club like that can't maintain a football stadium that big but then again you look at that fifa's gone in and said oh yeah build a stadium there brazil went okay we'll do that Hmm. build a stadium fifa's got all the profits out of everyone going to brazil and all the um, tv money and all that and then they've left and it's like well you're not going to help them out yeah what does the country actually get out of it so not a lot basically all yeah. they all they get out of it is to showcase the international platform what they can do how great the games can be when they host them 
other pe- in, in the hope of other people thinking, oh, they're a really good country, I'm going to go visit. But it doesn't really end up following through with statistics. They never really show people actually, um, sorry, not people, the country's actually increasing the tourism numbers after those events. Well, I, I was just thinking about while you were saying that, you've seen in recent years, we've started to see more and more corrupt authoritarian regimes um, not apply like put their candidacy candid, candidacy into host Olympic Games. Like China, uh, Beijing hosted the Summer Olympics in 2008, and now Beijing is applying again to host the Winter Olympics. Yeah. But, but, it's, but you hosted the Summer Olympics, so how can you host the Winter Olympics? You, well, this is going to make it artificial, and again, it's, it's, the, it's the aspect of, oh, we're going to make it so good that everyone's going to watch it and want to come here and potentially boost tourism and whatnot. Um, and then, yes. Yeah. It's, it's also about giving the perception that this is a thriving society. Yeah. Which is the really key thing, which is, I think, which I think is probably another reason why you would see these corrupt dictators or corrupt regimes uh, trying to host the Olympics because they want to show that this is a thriving society, even though you know, everyone with a brain knows that it isn't. As you said, the perception of it is, yeah, when the London 2012 Olympics was around, I was in it. I was about like, oh my God, this is the best thing ever. It didn't take very long after that to kind of slip off my mind of how much legacy it left. It just went, oh yeah, that was a good time. Mm. Um, how were you involved? Um, so I was actually um, volunteering at both the Olympics football as a ball boy and the Paralympics football. So the Paralympics football, they've got five aside who are, I think, they're completely blind, and the seven aside who are partially um, disabled. So when I say partially disabled, I mean they've got uh, cerebral palsy or cerebral palsy, however you want to call it, but they've got different grades onto how many players you can field with what type of disability they've got. So it's actually, when you look at them playing, you don't notice them really being disabled. And I found that more entertaining than any other sport, well, I say any other sport, the actual football and the five-a-side football. That um, five-a-side football, unfortunately, I didn't get to work at, but it was the seven-a-side football that I worked at. And I was there for the, all the medal matches and it was the best experience that I've had. Um, and of course, why, why was why was it so much more entertaining? First of all, they play on a hockey pitch, so it's a little bit smaller. It's almost like five a side, but it's seven. So the the goals are a little bit smaller, and it's probably because the stadiums wasn't really big. It was a one stadium, and I don't know if um, anyone's seen the hockey stadium, but it was basically um, scaffoldings put up together for the seats, and it was all temporary where there was, I don't know, five, 6,000 people at most. And the atmosphere around, because the Paralympics gave me an impression that people just wanted to go to a London 2012 event for the sake of going, rather than missing out. And London, the actual Olympics, didn't have enough tickets to, of course, sell, because all these big corporations sold off their tickets. But no one actually ended up turning up but that's a different issue so with the Paralympics it seemed like there was a lot more atmosphere at places seemed like people were actually enjoying it whereas the Olympics it seemed to be a little bit quieter no one really cared as such and I don't know if it was just it probably was just the um, uh, the sport in itself in football but the experience in itself I couldn't put anything past it. it was one of the best experiences I've had in my life. Mate, that's awesome. I didn't get to go to any of the uh, Olympic events, but I did get to go to some of the Paralympic events. Yeah. Well, I got to see wheelchair basketball, which is nothing like real basketball because it's <laughs> contact. Yeah. Like they're ramming each other. It's, it's, it's like rugby combined. Yeah, basketball. I was just about to say it's like rugby, but with wheelchairs. <laughs> Literally, they, they, they're, they're both going for a ball and then suddenly there's a crash and they just get on with it. It's fine. Yeah. And then we also went to see um, the swimming as well. So I got to see Paralympic swimming. And who's that famous British Paralympic swimmer? I Ellie Simmons. Simmons. Yeah. So I got to see her in, um, it wasn't the evening session. So you didn't get to see like a 
medal race, but you yeah. got to see the uh, what's it called, the heats, heats yeah. which is pretty cool. Like that was a pretty cool experience. That's one thing that really well didn't upset me, but I really wished I went to is the swimming. Mm. Having been a, a swimmer at quite a high level, um, you know, watching on TV back in 2012 when I was still swimming, I, I would say that inspired me a little bit. Um, I wouldn't say it inspired me for a long time, um, but it definitely inspired me in a way that I saw all these people and it was almost live. Well, it was live on TV, but <laughs> um, it was just one of those things where you think, oh, I might be there. And back when I was 16, it was all possible yeah i definitely took inspiration from that as well even though i was not at a high level like yeah. as high a level as you were yeah I definitely took some inspiration from that for a good year and then reality set in and then you're like mm. <laughs> but I'm, I'm i'm still happy that i gave it a good go rather than um just so do you, do you mean you gave it a good go in the aspect that you went and trained or how yeah, I, I definitely upped the training. So um, I, I, def I increased the number of days I, I went to training and everything. So I was really happy that, and I went to more competitions, like to try and get good times. Yeah. Even though I, I couldn't. <laughs> I, I at least tried, right? But rather than just sitting back and saying, oh, I, I, you know, what if or whatever. Now yeah. I'm, I'm not good and that's fine. Well, that, that's... that's... I mean, it's, that's what it's all about, isn't it? The Olympics, where when you've got all these people who, like me, have been training from a young age, and we reach a point where, for me, I couldn't continue swimming if I wanted to actually pursue uh, my academic aspirations because it just wouldn't work out. I, unfortunately, I wasn't privileged enough to be able to continue with that. But and I'm not saying everyone is privileged because I think some people have worked a lot harder than probably I did um but yeah it's just one of those things where you look back at it and you think oh I wish I tried harder or I wish I did this I wish I did that but back in the time you couldn't really know especially being at a, yet an age where you don't really know much in life let alone think about decisions where it would make you an elite athlete and I think for those elite athletes I'm not saying they're completely lucky because uh, as I said, they work really hard, but quite a lot of things fall into place at the right time for them to be able to make that. Um, There's which... loads of things that have to go their way. Like you, 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 it, it's only when you like, you start speaking to people who actually work in sport, you realize the level of support these kids get. And yeah. this, this is from a young age and they get ID'd at like ridiculously young ages where yeah. Like that, and they're given S and C coaches and physios and diet help. I had nothing. I don't think you had much either, did you? In the way of support. Um. Well, I was quite lucky in a way. I, I got quite a bit of support when I was um, what six to about ten. Where um, at the swimming club that I was at, it was, it was really good. I mean, this is going back quite a bit, but my parents moved here um, throughout those times to the UK and I wasn't born in the UK so I live with my grandparents and when my grandparents were working I had I was basically given money and told to go to training so I had to go get on a bus go to training at that age um, and when I got to training I got the support when I was there we had a relatively established swimming club there so that kind of kept me um, off the streets I guess if you want to call it that way um, but it could have turned it could have turned much worse if I wasn't spending so much time you know running around um, on a foot on just uh, land training doing all these things with my team swimming however many hours of course back then it wasn't as much but I did get quite a lot of support and I think had I stayed there I could have maybe gotten a little bit further than I got to when I came here and the support was different because we were just a swimming club that got on with swimming. There was never really the strength aspect of it. And my parents, of course, were both working. It was difficult in that regard. And when I got a little bit older, my coach stepped in and helped me a little bit. But even then, there wasn't really the aspect of, um, you know, you've got an SNC coach, you've got a, I don't know, psychologist, you've got someone who helps you um, with your 
one-to-one -one coaching sessions it was just like oh well i've got a, a group of 20 people for my coach and he just gets on with it and that was it really uh, gym sessions i was doing on my own um getting to training was the only thing i would say that helped me but you know my parents have done a lot of things like pay the membership for the club so i can't fault them for that so yeah, you can't complain too much but it, i i guess yeah when you compare the two it's strange that in israel you were able to access much more than you were here yeah but i also think that's probably dependent on the uh, size of the club and with the history of the club because i know that that club when i was in israel they produced a few olympians whereas from what I know, I'm here for Leatherhead, I've only heard of one Olympian and he, well, long story short, he was supposed to swim at the relays um, in the, for the final team because, of course, you know, they've got eight people, four yeah. for the heats, four for the final. The four were supposed to be getting to the final quite easily. They didn't get into the final, so he never actually ended up swimming in the Olympics, which is quite funny for me. But of it's course, it's for him. kind of funny, but at the same time, you're like, yeah. oh, fuck me. Yeah, How so, recent was that? Um, 2000, uh, I think it was 2000. He was supposed to be swimming in Sydney um, and never actually ended up swimming. It's, it's, objectively, it's quite funny. But at the same time, when you look at it, you're like, oh, my fuck. That's, yeah. that's awful. And of course, that being in 2006, that was a quite a recent thing. Whereas historically, the clubs in Israel produced quite a lot of swimmers to quite a high level. So there was that expectation that, you know, you wouldn't be pushing weights at the age of eight or nine, but you would at least be doing some kind of pull-ups. You'd be doing, well, almost getting your body prepared for the land training, the strength side of things. Yeah, well, that's the progression. You need to be able to do everything body weight before you start to add extra weight, extra, extra load on that. Yeah. I mean that, you know, if you can't, if you can't do a squat properly, like with no load or anything, there's no point sticking a barbell on your back and 50 kilograms on there. Yeah. Stupid. Like if, if, if anyone like is thinking of starting a gym, do that instead, get your form right. But yeah, it's, it's so sad. Like when you, when you, when we speak about all of this, but all the dreams that people have and how hard they work, like we just spoke about, to then have that taken away by someone doping and by all this systemic corruption. Yeah. Just and I think a nice chat for 10 minutes about the power of sport, how, how much it means to us. And it means a lot to a lot of people. And then this, all of this stuff. Yeah, I think, like you say, some people work so hard and, you know, a lot of things don't fall into place. And we're saying, for me, it didn't work out. Had I reached a little bit higher of a level where, you know, I was actually in the GB team, for example, yeah. it would have been a point for me where I would have never been the elite athlete in the GB level. I wouldn't have been the best swimmer there. Where some people don't like that because you get to that level and you, you know you're good. And you think, oh, oh, but I'm not good enough to do this. So what, what is there to stop you from going and doping? Because that would be the incentive for you to get sponsorships. That would be the incentive for you to get more money. And then that would build your career up. So I see why people would go dope. I think the current regulations are not good enough where they don't allow people to do that if that's what they want to do. But I also think there should be regulations for a well a, a, a section for a sport where you're pure and you don't do anything so mm. it's all up to the people and i think it's giving people that freedom where you can go and screw up your body if you want to we're not liable for it you can go do what you want um just don't kill yourself i guess yeah like 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 the power lift power lifting model i guess where you've got the split in federations that seems to just make the most sense but then when you consider there's so much money on the line for like to, to keep it monopolized in one organization yeah. i completely get why these people are kind of why they're kind of tethering both lines almost yeah and i don't know i just hate when you've got athletes like um armstrong where he was doping for so many years and he denied it for so many years and then it all 
erupted and he was like oh yeah um it was, it was like a mistake or whatever he tried to get away with it he's like if i if i had the chance to do it again i would do it again so it's like how can you be a normal like person and say that when other people i'm not saying all cyclists are um completely pure but i'm not saying they're completely all um all doped up but to take that chance away from other people and you say that you would do it again i think it's so selfish it is very selfish, but then a lot of athletes have to be very selfish in order to I, be successful. I agree, but to say that he would have won it the same way he won it seven times in a row, that's not um, a way to go about things to say he would do it again. I mean, it's very hard because at the time, because he started cycling in the 90s professionally, at the time, early 90s, that was when doping like, was rife in cycling. And that yeah. was when you had to dope in order to keep up. And he didn't, yeah, win, he didn't win anything then. Um, but you, like, that was the culture in order to be successful. And so at that point, I don't actually blame him at the start of his career. But then when there was a team that got, that got caught in late 90s, and so the, you know, cycling clamped down, and so cycling from that point on was, was a clean sport. And then after that, in the 2000s, he started winning. And that coincided completely with um, the fact that, you know, all of his competition was wiped out. They were doping, he was doping, but they were caught. And so they were gone out the way. Yeah, well, you look at, you look at sports now and you think to yourself, well, what sport would you associate doping the most with? Just an answer quickly weightlifting really I yeah i would say cycling cycling is the second one it was between weightlifting and cycling because you look at these abnormal lifts that these guys have been doing um if you compare the lifts today where they're breaking world records it seems like every other competition seriously there was a 19 year old chinese kid who who came very, very close to breaking the senior world record. 19. Mm. 19. He's, that, that's mental. And they obviously have weight categories and things, and they keep shifting them around. Yeah. And if you compare the weights to, that they're lifting today to the weights that they were lifting in the 60s and 70s, when steroid use amongst weightlifters was the, the highest it's ever been, like it, it, you had to do it. Like with cycling in the nineties, where you had to dope in order to be successful. If yes. you compare, hang on, hang, hang on. If you compare the two weights, they're still not up to the level of what it used to be in the sixties and seventies. They're still not leveling that. So, if you if you were to blame someone, who would that be? Oh shit! I'm not saying a person. I think. I think. It ultimately comes down to governments and kind of national pride or like, um, well, the thing with the Olympics and the Olympic medal table is it, it, it doesn't just make it about a competition between individual athletes, between you and me. It makes it a competition between countries where you've got the US and China first and second and then you kind of got the UK, Russia, and somebody else. Germany, Australia. Yeah, exactly, yeah. So you've kind of got that, that league of, it's, it's like a measuring stick to see who's got the biggest dick, basically. Well, <laughs> good analogy. <laughs> um, I, th I think what you're trying to say there is right, but I, I, I would also add to that, that it's the national sporting organizations um, and the international sporting organizations that are to blame for it because they're not taking this doping problem uh, or not a problem, but just the whole aspect of doping well enough where you've got this, the um, cycling is being um, linked to uh, doping quite a lot for you saying weightlifting is being linked um, to it. And my worry is from a swimming background, my worry is with all the Sanyang stuff, I don't know if you've heard of it. Yeah, I know Sanyang. 
yeah, where Fina went, oh, well, yeah, he doped once, and yeah, it's fine. We'll just let him back in again. Didn't they, really... they, gave, they gave him a four-month ban, but they enacted it retroactively. So it didn't yeah. affect him. He was still able to compete. Yeah, so it, it's kind of that kind of stuff that created um, the ISL, the International Swimming League, where you've got um, Adam Peaty saying that, you know, we're going to get better wages and all that, which is all great. But that's what's going to end up becoming if these big organizations don't actually look after what they're doing better than what they're doing at the moment, if that makes sense. What, the athletes will go their own way? I think with, I, I mean, the major thing with ISL is, of course, the pay and the treatment and all that. So that's why swimmers went that way. I'm I think, not sure I think the big that. thing with the ISL, the International Swimming League, that's what it's called, right? Yeah. Okay. The, the big thing with that is making sure that at the moment it, it's only if you're in the top 10 that you can make a decent income, right? Everyone yeah. else below that really struggles. And yeah. so the, aim, the main aim with ISL is making sure that that money can eventually start to trickle down and it can become a proper professional sport. Exactly. It's only in the first stages at the moment. But all I'm saying is the whole idea of it, actually making it fairer and, you know, being actually looked after. That's what's going to end up happening with um, maybe not in the near future with some sports like football, because they're fine how they are. It's the organisations that are the problem. But with cycling, that could be an issue where, you know, you've got a few athletes that they don't think that they're being looked after very, very well, that you know, they're being thought of as someone who dopes, for example. They'll go and they'll start their own thing where they'll say, well, actually, we've got someone who looks after us properly. We get proper wages. We get, like, you know, better package as a whole. And then that will, that will come to light where the last one will always have the reputation of the doper, potentially. Yeah. That's so that maybe that could be the split of the pure and the um, the doper. Hmm. And on that note, I think that was um, a very good podcast. So thank you for listening to it all. Yeah. We've we've ranted for quite long, and as we speak, Chelsea are winning two one in extra time. So Frank Lampard has done it for Liverpool. Right. right. We're going to end this now. We're going to end this now so that Dan can watch the end. If you got to this point, thanks for watching. And we'll see you again next time. Cheers. Thank you.